Welcome to the Bradenton area on the Gulf Coast of Florida, where the easy pace of island life comes naturally in this coastal playground with endless white sand beaches, stunning natural preserves to explore, relaxing vibes all around, and it's a seafood lover's paradise. Plan to stay a while to explore vibrant downtown Bradenton with top-rated attractions like the Bishop Museum of Science and Nature and discover this friendly community set along the Bradenton River Walk, where you'll find lots of surprises around every corner. Come lose yourself in the sun-drenched Gulf Coast and change your reality here in the Bradenton area. Discover Florida's West Coast in Bradenton, Anna Maria Island, and Longboat Key. Learn more at BradentonGulfIslands.com. Welcome to this amazing panel that we have put together for day three of the Glowsurf Conference. My name is Dr. Faizan Ali. I'm an assistant professor 
at the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management, the MoMA College of Business, University of South Florida. Uh, first of all, before we get into the panel or everything, don't hate us for showing you this amazing video. We are just lucky to be in Florida, in sunny Florida. So, um, you know, and it's really sunny out there. So, uh, hello, welcome, good afternoon, good good morning, good evening, whatever time zone you are from in, because we had a lot of people registered for this panel from all over the world. So uh, the panel is titled as uh, Impact of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics on Retail and Services. Uh, we all know that, um, especially after pandemic, COVID-19, any time that we talk about future, it's somehow hijacked by artificial intelligence and robotics. Like that's the first thing people ask about and people talk about. Now, uh, uh, interestingly, the discussions are sometimes by people who know quite a lot about artificial intelligence and robotics. And sometimes they are uh, from people who have just seen a video about robotics on social media. So we have a whole spectrum of different things people talk about these uh, buzzwords that we have around us. Uh, to make it easier for all of us to understand, we have put together this panel. Uh, it's a star-studded panel. Uh, I actually was struggling to know who should I introduce first, but what I'll do is make it easy. I'll go with the uh, alphabetical order of the names. Uh, first of all, I would introduce Professor Crispin Combs. Hello, Professor Crispin. Hello. Uh, okay, so I'll quickly say a couple of things about Professor Crispin and then we'll go to our other speakers. Professor Crispin is a reader in information systems in the School of Business and Economics, Loughborough University, United Kingdom. Um, he holds several editorial positions, senior editorial positions uh, at the Euro European Journal of Information Systems, Information Technology and People, and the International Journal of Information Management. Uh, and believe me, all these journals are doing wonderful work in uh, research about uh, information management and technology. He is the former vice president of the UK Academy of Information Systems and a member of the business and management studies sub panel for the assessment phase of the UK Research Excellence Framework 2021. Uh, welcome again, Professor Crispin. Um, I'll move on to uh, Ms. Elithia, uh, Dr. Elithia, uh, Oria Ginner. Uh, hello, Elithia. Hello. Yeah, your name seems like Alicia, but it's Alithia. I got myself corrected. So Alithia is a lecturer at Ray One Carlos University. She holds a PhD in tourism from the same university and a PhD in geography from University Paris, Pantheon, Sorbonne. I hope this is the right pronunciation. If not, I apologize. So uh, Alithia, you are with two PhDs here with us. Um, and uh, she is a member of the OpenOva Research Group and an associate researcher at the Equip Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary de Researcher Sur Les Tourismi. Oh, gosh, that, that was difficult. <laughs> uh, at University of Paris. Um, all right, so welcome, Alithia, to, to the panel. Uh, I'll now move on to uh, Professor Balaji Padmaban, Padmanaban. Uh, Balaji is... Uh, Anderson, Professor of Global Management and Professor of Information Systems at USF's MoMA College of Business. So I'm very proud to have him here because we are colleagues in the same college. Um, he is also the director of the Center for Analytics and Creativity. He has a bachelor's degree in computer science from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and a PhD from New York University's Stern School of Business. He has published and also served on the editorial boards of leading journals in data science and related areas. Welcome, Balaji. All right, last but not the least, now we have um, a distinguished university professor, Ronald West. Um, so Ronald West, hello. We have Professor Ronald West, who is David Bruce Smith Chair in Marketing at Robert H. Smith School of Business at University of Maryland, where he is also the founder and executive director of Center of Center for Excellence in Service. He is visiting chair in marketing research at Erasmus, Erasmus University, Netherlands, and international research fellow of Oxford University's Center for Corporate Reputation, as well as VP of Publications for European Marketing Academy. Um, uh, Professor Ronald is author of recently published book, The Feeling Economy, How Artificial Intelligence is Creating the Era of Empathy, which actually I caught my eyes on the back right now. <laughs> so I see a red cover page of the book. Um, 
He has consulted with several leading companies worldwide, um, including American Airlines, uh, Dow Chemical, uh, FedEx, uh, Hewlett Packard, IBM, and uh, many, many more. Uh, welcome, Professor Roland West. Thank you. All right. So the, now when we have the introductions out of the way, we can start with the panel. Uh, however, before we go into formal questions, I would request each of the panelists to tell us a little bit, just a couple of sentences. On what is your experience in uh, artificial intelligence or robotics? How do you see how do you use them? Have you studied them? Do you work with them? What is it? So let's start with Alithia first. Um, Alithia, tell us a little bit about your experience with AI and robotics. Okay, so first, I would like to thank the organization of the Global Conference on Services and Retail Management. It's a pleasure to be here today talking about artificial intelligence and robots on retail and service. Uh, my experience related to robots is connected with some uh, research that we are developing at Rey Juan Carlos University focused on the part of how uh, robots can be accepted by customers of hotels. So uh, that is uh, my experience and it is also related to artificial intelligence because we are using data mining uh, methodologies and also matching learning models. All right, thank you, Alithia. So you are studying it with regards to consumer behavior and academic research, right? All right, let's move to um, Professor Roland Rust. Uh, Professor Roland, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with AI and robotics? Um, sure. Yeah, I really uh, started out uh, doing uh, really AI algorithms, uh, what uh, we call adaptive personalization systems. In, in other words, uh, uh, mathematical methods of uh, doing uh, learning based on information from customers based on their behavior. So uh, then uh, also I, I've done work on uh, using AI methods for natural language processing and uh, some of my latest publications have been in that. Uh, but much of my work over the last several years uh, along with my co-author Minghui Huang uh, has really related to uh, how artificial intelligence is affecting business and in particular well uh, and, and that came out of a, a long-standing interest in how technology is affecting business so uh, much of what Minghui and I have done is uh, to uh, consider how AI is changing the business world how it changes how we should manage especially how we should do marketing management because marketing is my field um, and and um, so the, the book, The Feeling Economy, is really about that. And uh, the, uh, to, to just uh, very quickly summarize what our main thesis is in the book, the main thesis is that as AI is assuming more thinking tasks, humans are going to be forced to emphasize their feeling side more. Mm -hmm. All right, very interesting. So you started with the technical side of AI and uh, algorithm stuff, moving more towards how it impacts businesses and stuff. So very interesting. All right, let's move to um, Balaji. Uh, Balaji, please uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with. Uh... <clears throat> thank, thank you, Faizan, for uh, having me. I mean, this is a fantastic panel, and you know, uh, for me, it's funny because AI is the reason I'm here, uh, and and I'll t tell you why. You know, about little more than twenty five years back. Uh, I was doing my undergrad in computer science, and uh, I did two courses in AI. My undergraduate thesis was in AI in a topic called genetic algorithms. And at that point, uh, you know, AI was very synonymous with search, search algorithms broadly. And uh, so when I worked on genetic algorithms and I applied for PhD programs, that got me interested in, hey, I, you know, I enjoy this thing. You know, I want to do some uh, research in this. I got a call from a professor in a business school at NYU uh, who said, we want to apply AI and machine learning in retail. Uh, and we like what you did in your thesis. Will you join our group? And, and that's what got me into that. And my very first project was machine learning on Nielsen's consumer purchase data in 93. And uh, so, so, so since then, I've been in uh, research primarily, but also working with companies a lot in the machine learning component of AI. Now, AI is much broader. Machine learning is a very specific part of AI. And so that's the area where I spent probably, you know, 25 years. Uh, and, and I have I had a lot of fun, you know, on both the research side as well as working with companies. 
Uh, and and that's why you know I think AI is the reason I'm in the career I am in right now. So uh, I would not be here without uh, AI. So thank you for that. Very interesting. So what got me interested in your answer was that you were doing AI when many people didn't know what is internet. 1993, you said, right? We, we 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 didn't have email. Email just started then. Right. And that that was uh, so. My my thesis was in uh, Pascal and C on okay. genetic algorithms. So very interesting. Thank you, Balaji. And uh, last but not least, Professor Crispin. So um, uh, your experience with AI and robotics. Thank you. I was just thinking I can remember when email started as well. So we're showing our age. Um, <laughs> come through. My interest um, actually stemming to give a, a little bit of background is, is mainly about the use of technology in organizations and the impacts it has on people and whether that leads to technology being seen as a success or failure. So most recently, I've been interested in the application of AI in a business context, um, how that can be done successfully, um, what sort of things need to be taken into account in terms of the strategy that a company employees, um, but also looking at how that might impact on job design and um, activities and process around it. Possibly the most interesting, uh, our current research project we've got looking at is looking at uh, meat inspection from a food uh, safety standards point of view and using imaging cameras to try and support the human meat inspector. Uh, and AI obviously being used in the background to help with sort of processing those, um, correctly identifying any uh, poultry being processed that is um, either defective or has a food safety concern or a quality concern most normally. Um, and the challenges around that and what it means for the human meat inspector and how that would be achieved. So those are the aspects. But if you were to, to sum me up, I'm, I'm probably looking at the business benefits of AI um, and how that works in an organization. Very interesting. Uh, so we have Professor Roland who looks at marketing aspects of it, and then you are looking at uh, procurement or inspection or stuff like that, which is pretty interesting. So while you are at it, Professor Crispin, I'll go to my uh, first formal question, uh, and I would want you to tell us. Uh, the first question that I want to put in front of you is, based on your experiences, right, so far, whatever you have done in this field, what do you think artificial intelligence is? Like, how are you going to define it? Uh, yeah, I generally think of AI as, as a suite of technology, so not just one technology. And I think that's something that we often see a lot in the media as, as, as tending to lump AI as, as one thing. And I think that can be problematic. But it, it's, it's those technologies that can either sort of meet or, or surpass human capabilities typically around things in terms of learning, cognitive abilities, uh, and um, aspects such as problem solving. So, but the different facets of it, I mean, I'm always thinking sort of when we talk about it, you know, it's knowledge reasoning, we've got machine learning, we've got natural language processing that sort of Ronald's already mentioned and, um, and, and so on, the other panel members. So it, it's a lot of things involved in that. Um, and I think sort of as a, as a kickoff, it, it's, it's that learning aspect that I always think that I look for in papers to really tease out actually what's different here. And it should be able to sort of make those decisions, often without human um, intervention. Perfect. So, um, well, I'll not point this question specifically to um, any of the panelists, but uh, while we have three other distinguished speakers, is um, anybody wants to contribute to what uh, Professor Crispin just said about AI, if um, anyone wants to contribute to that definition, anything else, any other perspective? Well, I'll, I'll just add a conceptual and practical definition, right? So because conceptually, you know, if you trace back to the roots of AI and so on, I think it always started with this fancy notion of can machines think, right? And this was the classic paper by Alan Turing, you know, uh, 1950s. And, and so there was always a fascination to building software or machines that could think or demonstrate human-like intelligence. I think today we've gone into human like to even better than human intelligence in some areas, right? Uh, so the, the concept of building intelligent machines is at the core of AI. Now, over the years, what is intelligence has evolved, right? And intelligence is always associated with some types of problem solving, right? In the early days, that, kind, that problem solving was doing things like playing chess, right? Which was, you know, how you show intelligence. But today that might be, you know, showing a self-driving car, right? 
And, and so the use cases of what it means to be intelligent have obviously evolved with the times, but at the core of AI is you know, what makes a system intelligent, right? That's the conceptual thing. Now in practice today, I think we can almost define intelligence uh, AI as having three components. There is the robotics, there is the language recognition driven AI, there's the robotics driven AI, and then there is the computer vision driven AI, which is, you know, largely image classification and self-driving. So within these three practical buckets, there are tons of use cases. So if, if you want to look at it from a practical point of view, you can say, hey, you know, if I had com perfect computer vision, perfect language understanding, perfect robotics, what can I build today? If you want to look at it conceptually, you can say, what does it mean for something to be intelligent and are we building intelligent systems? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, uh, any other panelists? Professor um, Roland, do you have anything well, to add? Uh, sure. I, yeah, I can add something. I, I, I'd like to just uh, mention a couple of things that I think AI is not limited to. Uh, this uh, was mentioned already, but uh, it's not just machine learning, and uh, mm -hmm. it's it's broader than that. Uh, I, th I think that's an important thing to realize. The, the other thing to realize is that AI is not just robots, and uh, in particular, there's a lot of AI that's really embedded AI that is, uh, and especially embedded in the network, the the internet in particular. And uh, so I, I believe that uh, it's important to consider uh, AI as being something that can be uh, distributed uh, very widely in a network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so that is a good insight as well. And Al Alithia, anything um, you want to contribute to it? Yes, uh, thank you. So I would like to add that industry 4.0 tools can also add value to the service and retail industry and this type of technologies that include this as uh, we were saying artificial intelligence and also robots can uh, allow to automatize uh, production processes and this type of approach uh, is crucial to improve service quality and also customer satisfaction so in some cases uh, because of that these type of tools are also connected within them. All right, perfect. So uh, Balaji, you brought a good point. You talked about intelligence, right? And that the nature of intelligence being changed. So I have um, something to ask of you. And you said that um, basically intelligence is problem solving or it used to be problem solving. Uh, do you, would you agree now um, uh, for, especially for artificial intelligence, we are beyond problem solving and we are now in more towards predicting things or creating problems before solving them? Or do you think that's not where we are at yet? So so I, I think problem solving has been at the heart. I don't think you can equate it with intelligence, but problem solving is a way to show intelligence, right? I mean, intelligence is this more abstract concept. Uh, and uh, I, I think problem solving is at the heart of AI today because I mean, most of the successful use cases there is a there is something that is being solved, right? So the you know self-driving cars are popular because people want to drive. The problem is to you know build a machine that can drive by itself. So these are not just solutions in search of a problem. Most successful AI applications are actually solutions that are solving very useful problems in in the field today. Every now and then you do have you know a solution that's there that creates a new market, right? And things like that do happen. Uh, but but I think the AI has at least in the in in the kind of work I've seen has been very practical in that sense. It hasn't been purely there. There, there is a lot of theoretical work in cognitive science and how people think and what how the brain functions. That that's that's always very fascinating. But being on the business side of AI, I think a lot of the things I come across tend to be very practice practical oriented. You know, so they they do have uh, even today. I would say if you think of the most successful uses, you can think of problems they're solving. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to come to Professor Roland. You uh, mentioned that, you know, uh, AI is not only about machine learning or it's not only about robotics. It's more than that, right? So my question to you is, um, these days when you talk to people, and you may have observed this, right, regardless of um, their field of inquiry or their intelligence level or whatever, when you talk about future or technology, automatically AI comes up. It's more like a buzzword, right? So in your opinion, why do you think AI has got such a traction? It, it has become into a buzzword. Well, I think the uh, the biggest reason that it's become a buzzword is that uh, 
uh, deep learning neural networks have become successful. I think that's, uh, that's the number one reason. You know, people can actually use it and it works. So um, I think that that uh, created a lot of interest. You know, the, uh, the original uh, thinking about AI really was more top down. It was more expert systems. And now it's, it's more of a bottom up. You know, neural nets are really bottom up. All right, um, and um, I'm going to go to Professor Crispin. Uh, you, you mentioned a very interesting avenue of uh, using AI, and that is for inspection, meat inspection, and uh, poultry and stuff like that, right? So when you work with industry partners or people, you know, that are not really using AI tra in a traditional way, right? Which is marketing insights and business insights and stuff like this. In, in that domain, what would you think why people use or not use this AI in such industries? Well, I think there's part of that. I mean, one of the challenges whenever you start engaging with industry is the extent to which they understand what indeed AI is and what it can do and what its capabilities are. Um, so in terms of it becoming a buzzword, I think that there's that there are challenges around that because that there's there is so much hype associated with this um, technology, the advances and um, and progress there. So often in those cases, the, the first step with working with any business is actually recognizing what their knowledge level is, what they understand it to be, and whether they understand where some of the problems in terms of actually being able to apply AI actually occur, um, such as you know the quality of your data and, and, and um, labeling issues around sort of um, being able to use AI in a useful fashion. So I think that's a big challenge. But I think in terms of the buzzword and, and how, why this motivates people to be engaged in it and, and, and go from there, then I think um, it's very much sort of academics of Frey and Osborne who've been, have been the problem. Um, and and we've <laughs> really sort of generated this interest when they were coming up with statistics saying that forty seven percent of jobs in the states could be could be automated within ten years. Um, that sort of back creates interest uh, and goes from there. So I think in terms of your previous question, that that was uh, a principal interest. I think why some industries get it and some don't, um, and some engage with it more. I think a lot of it depends on the type of task that's trying to be automated. Um, because some tasks lend themselves to automation if they're routine, they're repetitive, uh, and they're clearly defined. Um, whereas if it's something else that is perhaps more manually based, then it doesn't lend itself so easily. So the example I'll give is, 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 is the classic, your automated hoover um, mm -hmm. can work very well in terms of hoovering a floor, but it can't clean in terms of dusting. It can't tidy your house. It can't move between floors unless you pick it up. So there are limitations in what these uh, technologies can do. So I think a lot of it from the business point of view is actually, first of all, understanding what AI is and how can we apply it and what sort of tasks are we looking to apply it to. Sure, uh, a very detailed answer, and I think it makes sense uh, with, with regards to use cases and everything. Um, Alithya, uh, my question to you is similar, right? You said you work with AI in terms of consumer research and stuff like that, right? So um, why, when we look at uh, consumer side of it, right, understanding AI and what benefits can it bring to consumers, uh, what type of um, industries do you see that apply AI much more uh, considering consumer side of stuff uh, compared to others? So uh, the use and adoption of artificial intelligence and robots is uh, improving and there are a lot of types of uh, sectors that can use it. For example, the case of hotels and also restaurants is well known because uh, there is a real world application for this type of businesses, especially in uh, South Korea, for example, or even America and European countries. Uh, unfortunately, there are still a lot of work to do because this type of interaction with the customer is based on the human uh, robot interaction. And sometimes there are some problems related to the different tasks that the robots can develop uh, by using uh, artificial intelligence also and sometimes the customer wants to uh, have a more personal attention and also they want to develop an emotional link with the robot 
and uh, to start a relationship with the robot and sometimes it's not possible because of the characteristics of the task that the robots are developing. For example, in the case of a front desk robot, it's not possible to uh, have a normal conversation with them sometimes because uh, the technology doesn't allow to do that. All right. Thank you, Alitia. Uh, Badaji, my um, next question is to you. And I know from uh, talking to you and listening to you that um, you work with several companies and organizations. Um, are there any uh, best case examples on top of your head um, where the application of AI was really good? Like best case examples, in, especially in services and retail sectors? So, uh, you know, I, I think if you uh, look at some of the examples we are seeing, uh, it, it is, I think the best examples come when uh, you have organizations that are trying to rethink the customer experience, right? So what would it mean, you know, if you had access to these technologies, how would the customer experience be tremendously different, right? So when you think that way, you can design a lot of front end AI applications, right? And so customer experience, maybe, you know, a customer walking into a retail store, looking at a, a, a dress or a shirt and automatically seeing themselves in it, right? And, and seeing themselves walk in it. Like this is a wow, right? In, you know, in the past, we had to go and try this, out, this on. Uh, customer experience and services, you know, could be you're in a, in a restaurant uh, or you're in a hotel, you're ordering stuff, it's COVID time, a robot delivers it to your door. In fact, we have this in uh, quite a few Disney hotels now in Florida, right? The, the robot actually takes the elevator, comes, gives you your food. Uh, customer experience, maybe it recognizes who you are and automatically lets you into places without you having to, you know, swipe a card and do things like this, right? And uh, customer experience, anytime you have a question, you, you know, just ask and somebody starts talking to you. You know, it's a conversational agent. It's a chatbot that can answer all your questions that can seamlessly transfer to a human when it needs to. Right. So when you think of all the use cases in retail with the with, with enhancing customer experiences, there are lots of very cool ideas of AI that naturally come. But at the same time, behind the scenes, I think Dr. Rust mentioned something really critical, which is a lot of the times the value that we see come from things we don't see. Uh, so in as customer experiences in a store change, uh, as their own uh, needs change, they may be buying different things. An intelligent quote unquote AI within a store should learn from that and automatically order the right things that get stocked up in the shelf without a human having to make that decision. Right. And similarly, at the back end, you know, I might be Macy's and I have orders for some new shirts that are going to be manufactured and shipped from Hong Kong. But the few things that I have in store now on social media, people are, you know, who first bought it have some problems. They're writing comments that as soon as we washed it, the shirt shrank. shrank. And I may have an order that I'm launching that's going to of million shirts that are going to be shipped tomorrow. But when these comments come on social media and sentiment is bad and, and I think I'm not going to be able to sell it, I should be able to have the option in the supply chain of stopping that shipment. Right. So no point in even getting it to retail. So there's a lot of magic that can happen that is happening in the supply chain at the back and in or how stores are getting automatically uh, populated that we'll never see. But then, you know, it's it's fun to design the front end applications, but to support it, you need the back end magic as well. And and all of this is happening in, as Dr. Rust would also, you know, share other stories in retail today. It is happening. Unfortunately, COVID time has also shown where it can go wrong, right? We've seen dramatic failures in supply chain performance uh, during COVID time, uh, partly because of consumer behavior doing unexpected things, and the toilet paper shortage, you know, is just something people like to joke around. Uh, but it's real, right? I don't know how many of you went to buy toilet paper during COVID time and how many shops you had to uh, look at and how much you had to pay. And it took a long time for that to go away. And, and if we had AI, you know, is it acceptable to, you know, have to wait four months before you have, uh, how good is it doing in the supply chain? So it's brought, brought up new questions as well. Um, all right. Uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, this uh, toilet paper shortage was uh, something many people were, you know, <laughs> really confused about. I mean, you, you can have a shortage of face masks or hand sanitizer. That makes sense. But then toilet paper <laughs> out of nowhere. All right. Uh, so I'm going to move to Professor um, 
Roland now, um, and um, I'm going to touch upon two points that were brought by Balaji and um, Professor Crispin. Um, Balaji, you said that you know that there's an intersection of front end and the back end and how things uh, happen. And then uh, Professor Crispin, you talked about um, you know the limitations of uh, robots and the type of things that can be automated and stuff like that. Um, and since Professor Roland is the author of The Feeling Economy, so my question to Professor Roland is this. Robotics and AI are two distinct areas, right? These are two distinct areas anyways. Do you see th these two areas merging to create better experiences? Uh, yes, no, why? And what can be implications of it? Uh, yes, I think they... they are merging or they, they really are, uh, a, uh, robotics is really a subset of AI. Um, so, um, you know, I think we, we see that. But one thing I'd like to mention is that I, I really think that uh, a lot of what AI is about is information service. Uh, for, for example, uh, here, here's my iPhone. This is, this is an AI device as far as I can tell. Uh, and uh, that's... Uh, because really what that device is supplying for me is information service. And, uh, and so because uh, AI is really good at, at uh, moving bits and bytes, it doesn't have to necessarily uh, move any uh, bricks and mortar sorts of things like, like physical robots. It doesn't have to have that. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of AI that's happening online that's, uh, that's really never physical. And I, I think that is, uh, and, and in fact, the pandemic has just accelerated the movement toward that. So uh, when I think of AI, I'm typically thinking something that's going on online. And so, for example, a lot of the uh, customer uh, interface right now is online. So, for example, um, if somebody is trying to uh, buy a product of some sort on a, on a website, typically uh, they will have to deal with some sort of chatbot or some sort of automatic device that, that tries to help. And uh, th that isn't a physical entity, uh, but it is, uh, it is something that, uh, that can, can help the, the, uh, the customer. And uh, so a lot of the uh, robotics is really... Uh, uh, digital robotics, it's, it's, it's chatbots and things like that. All right, perfect. So um, moving to um, Professor Crispin, uh, you, um, are, I mean, I, I'm still stuck on the meat inspection and normally this is done, <laughs> normally this is done manually, right? By somebody, a human who goes and inspect these things. The next question is pretty typical and you may have heard it on a lot of forums that people think robots or AI are here to replace human beings. What do you think about it? Uh, I, uh, it's, it's an inter you're right, it's a very interesting and, and usually a point of discussion. And I think also because we have a lot of pop culture, science fiction references to very unfavorable outcomes when it comes to sort of robots, Skynet scenarios and so forth, or you have the, uh, the WALL-E futuristic world. So we get these ideas in our heads as to how things might play out. And I think science fiction actually is very useful in giving us ideas, but it isn't always exactly how things are going to play out, fortunately. I think if you take the meat inspection situation, it, it's, it's a very interesting one because there's challenges around how, if you were to remove the human being from that role, then the technology is assigned the responsibility of saying that the food on that line is safe for human consumption. Now, prior to that, it would be a human trained inspector who would be making that decision, who's actually employed by a food standards agency. If you remove that person and you put in an AI system with an imaging and making that decisions, then the liability of, of that decision-making system may change, especially depending on who's purchased the system, who's implemented the system, who designed the system and so forth, whether it's the food standards organization or whether it's the host organization itself. So there's some interesting tensions around how does that work? Where does the liability go? And, and therefore, what does that mean for the meat inspector themselves? Do they get removed? Do they actually then start doing more value-adding activities? So, I mean, the, the task itself is very, um, repetitive. It's looking at a lot of birds, essentially, uh, poultry moving very fast along the production line, requires high levels of concentration. You can't do it for very long. 
But if you were allowing the machine to pick out the main activities, then you could potentially free up that meat inspector for looking for anomalies or double checking the system being correct or doing more in-depth investigations or alternative activities. So you could argue very much for, for the, the AI augmenting their role and supporting them rather than necessarily replacing them directly. And I think generally my, my view on this particular question and sort of a, and its various facets is, is that my position is that I see it as an augmented future. There will be winners and losers. There are definitely some jobs that have a small number of routine tasks and they lend themselves to automation like customer service uh, advisors and so on. And, and they are very potentially uh, automatable. But other tasks than that, I think it's far more likely to be a combination of working alongside AI uh, than it's simply dictating to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in your answer, you did mention some benefits versus limitations of both of them. And, you know, uh, which makes sense that a, a combination of both of them is what we are going to see in the future. This brings me to my next question to Alithia. And that is, um, in your opinion, based on your research, what are some of the major challenges for the use of AI in services and retail sectors? Okay, so the major challenges about the usage of, uh, in my case, service robots are related to their performance because robots' functionality plays a crucial role in the human-robot interaction because uh, robots can be used to enhance the customer experience and technology failures provoke negative uh, sentiments and affect the experience of the customer negatively. So. Um, it is important to remark that in some cases, service robots are, are marketing attractions uh, in some hotels, particularly for uh, families traveling with children. And robots are often the reason why families choose to go to one hotel or another. And hotels that can afford to invest in this technology to attract specific demand segments may deploy robots as a marketing uh, strategy in the case of wanting to to do it and however to make this strategy work it is essential to pro to provide robots uh, with constant maintenance and not focus on them as a mere tourist attraction so the robots must work perfectly and also is particularly relevant the wow effect of a robot that can uh, be produced in many guests. For example, uh, travelers from countries where robots have a more significant presence, for example, Japan or Singapore, generally require that the robot um, works uh, perfectly, be more flawless in its functions, and also uh, they are less surprised. Uh, however, for example, in the case of European travelers from uh, different uh, countries where service robots are uh, new for them, the human-robot interaction is fascinating and the wow effect that robots produce is very significant, especially in the case of children, as I said before. So uh, about the, um, the major challenges, uh, I think that in the case of a real application of uh, robotics on services and uh, retail sectors, they um, they must be sure that the technology works perfectly in the case of being uh, in uh, a direct contact with the customer because in the other case the experience is going to be negative for them thank you Alicia. Um, so I, I agree to your answer with regards to consumer and robot interaction and stuff um, i'm going to go to professor roland um, with another question that is about um, how organizations use it for human resource management related stuff or you know management decision related stuff and the question is uh, this question was asked by several people in the in the chat on social media right now uh, what type of decisions can manager transfer to ai to take and implement uh, the decisions they need to take yeah, that's that's a pretty good question. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, when AI really started out, it was uh, really along the lines of uh, the sorts of things that Crispin was pointing out. You know, the the idea that uh, AI can do the things that are that are repetitive. Uh, you know, that that you do the same thing the same way over and over and over again. 
And, and certainly AI has uh, taken that stuff over and has done very well with it. You know, we, we find it uh, useful to uh, consider three levels of intelligence. The, the first level being physical intelligence, which is the ability to do these repetitive things. Uh, the second level of intelligence being thinking intelligence, which starts to be analysis and then intuition. And then finally, there's feeling intelligence, and that's uh, the ability to, uh, to understand uh, emotion and to be able to uh, respond to it appropriately. So, uh, so I think that uh, right now, uh, basically, everybody's trying to give AI as much repetitive stuff as, as possible, you know, because that's, that's typically always going to be better with AI. Uh, where, where the battleground is right now is thinking AI because uh, the, uh, the current uh, AI methods such as uh, deep learning uh, are uh, making uh, great progress in thinking intelligence. Now, it still hasn't totally solved the problems. You know, you ha still have, for example, medical diagnoses that, that turn out to be wrong or maybe the patient doesn't uh, appreciate it. Um, but, but then, then uh, ultimately it'll be uh, uh, feeling intelligence, but right now, Right now, at the current level of progress, uh, really uh, AI is not that good at intuition and it's not that good at feeling intelligence. And so those are the things that managers need to uh, take over for themselves and give AI the things that it's better at. But AI is, is getting better at other stuff all, all the time. Uh, it'll probably take several decades to catch up with feeling intelligence, but there's, there is uh, existing work, for example, on uh, reading facial expressions, and there are also uh, robots that do a pretty good job of seeming as though they are expressing emotion. So, uh, so research is moving forward very rapidly in that, and it, it won't be uh, a safe haven for humans indefinitely. Very comprehensive answer. My so my next question is related to this question, and I'm going to go to Balaji for this one. Let's assume we have a situation where some decisions are given to AI to make and all that. Then definitely many people would think uh, about the biasness of those decisions because there's a lot of stuff behind it, right, learning. So uh, what do you think? Can AI be biased? Um, or are there any cases that you know where AI was um, considered biased? We, we just did a segment on this for a, in, a, in a different program where we highlighted many cases in uh, hiring, in healthcare, where there are daily examples coming out that show bias in AI. And uh, now I think you need to take one step back a little bit because I think this has a lot to do with the transparency uh, movement in AI. Uh, and and you know, I, I think we are at a point where people need to understand how AI works to a certain extent. Uh, even if you're a consumer, right? Even if you're in retail or services and you want to use this, you have to ask, like, you know, if somebody is selling you a product, right? And is, it is an AI product. You have to ask under the hood, how does it work? And, and broadly, I think, you know, Dr. Rust alluded to this earlier when he was talking about expert systems and deep learning. You know, the two very broad camps on how AI learns has been you feed it knowledge or you feed it data. And from the data, it learns the knowledge to become intelligent. This is it. You know, there's no third way. And in the old AI, you actually fed it knowledge. And that was the expert systems world. Like the humans coded the rules and the knowledge and that's and, and the box was, and it was a machine that we put in the knowledge, it behaves, right? And where does the knowledge comes from, come from? The knowledge comes from textbooks and stuff like that. Now, can those uh, systems go wrong? Of course it can go wrong, right? If you feed in you know, poor stuff, it's gonna behave badly, right? And, and there were lots of problems around managing that knowledge. Today's AI is powered by data. People say to step back and say, you know, I'm too lazy or I'm unable to provide all the knowledge or I simply cannot take all the data, learn from it, and then the data extract the knowledge and do your things, right? And so self-driving cars, right? If you feed it tons of data on uh, images and, and how to steer, it can learn, given a new image, how to steer. It's, it's, it's not surprising. If you show it a lot of faces and, and, and give it names of, 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 or, or, or tell it that this picture has a face in it, this picture doesn't, it's going to learn which pictures have faces in it, right? And it, and it shows intelligence. It recognizes a child who is drowning in a pool because it's seen many examples of people drowning in pools, right? It's been fed that data and it's learned from that data. So, when, so if this is how it works, then the question you step back and ask, can it be biased? Of course it can be biased, right? If, if the data somehow 
uh, that we're feeding in has issues, it's going to learn those issues. Uh, that may not be the only way it can be biased, right? but that is one way it can be biased. And and so, for instance, people you know talk about lending, right? So in the past, if you're learning from massive examples of previous cases where you've given loans to customers and you know which customers have paid the loans and which customers are not, and you want to build an AI to do automated lending, in the last 15 years, if you are biased, if you're giving loans only to certain people, uh, your AI is going to learn to be that way because that's how you're teaching it, right? And and so this is not surprising at all that, that, that we are facing these things. But I think it's worth noting that uh, the question to also ask is, is AI more biased than humans? And I think the answer to that in most cases is probably not. We still don't know, right? But but I would guess that, look, uh, humans have problems, AI has problems. Uh, the jury is still out uh, on, on that. Uh, but but, but I, I hijacked your question and went in a different direction. I'm so sorry about it. But I, I, I think the, the direction I was asking is people need to ask how AI works. And I think asking that question will answer the other question you posed. Uh, sure, Balaji. I, I think, I think Dr. Rust had up. some uh, yes. follow-up. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I thought maybe I had something to add here because I'm actually doing uh, current research on bank lending and its bias. And uh, in, in our case, we uh, classified people as being triangles or squares. So in other words, people don't really have any prejudice about that. And besides, we balance the design. So, uh, so that isn't going on. There isn't any uh, underlying prejudice in what's going on. But uh, in, in our research, what we found was that on average, the AI actually performs better in terms of coming up with people who are going to actually repay the loan. But it also discriminates more. That was... Uh, Perhaps not necessarily to be expected, but that's what we observe. Very interesting. And that's um, even even if it's totally rational and totally objective. Yes, it makes sense. It's uh, all right. Like Balaji said, it's about what it's been fed, right? So that that's what's going to come out. Um, all right. So the next question is somewhat similar to uh, uh, Professor Kristen, uh, and that's the ethical side of it. So. Uh, Balaji talked about the driverless cars or autonomous cars or stuff like this, and there was an interesting research that was done about uh, if there's a there, there's a situation where the car has to decide who to hit and who to save. Um, that was a pretty big thing all, all over the news, right? So <laughs> preference of one life or another life. Um, what do you think about it, Professor Crispin? What are your thoughts about um, uh, ethics of AI? Yes, it's a familiar use case. It's sort of it's the trolley the trolley experiment, isn't it? Sort of, and, and that conundrum of the trade-off between the two. I think actually, just on that point, one of the things I can remember, sort of, a professor at MIT sort of saying in a presentation is that they did a study um, in the US and I think in Japan and asked the same question, slightly different scenario. It was uh, uh, a motorcyclist on either side of a car, and the motorcyclist, uh, one was wearing a helmet, one was not. Which one do you hit if you have to swerve? Um, and in Japan, uh, the attitude was, will we swerve to hit the guy who is not wearing a helmet because they're not following the rules and therefore <laughs> they should be penalized. Um, and in the U S it was very much, we, we hit the guy with the helmet on because they're more likely to survive. And I think that in itself is an interesting dimension because ethics are very, very much ingrained in culture and our social cultures, and they are different across the world. So that is one aspect straight away that we need to consider is actually how do we apply ethical considerations? The second one obviously is those, how are we using AI? What is it being used for? Um, to what extent should the human be retained in the loop in any decision making? And when we get into this sort of space around sort of what, what are socially acceptable decisions, um and, and that may vary in different contexts um and also how can we effectively ensure that ai is regulated in such a way so coming back to professor Balaji's points around sort of explainable ai and being able to understand how it works i think you need all these pieces to be able to ensure that you are getting the decisions out of your ai system that as a society we are sort of ethically happy with and it's, it's not being sort of used for undesirable outcomes 
Very interesting insight. I, I, uh, I exactly agree to it that it depends on the culture and everything because it's so much engraved into it. What do we think of ethics in different cultures? Okay, coming to uh, Alithya. Alithya, uh, this is an interesting question uh, because you work with consumer behavior and stuff. So normally when we study uh, human to human interactions, there's something called uh, an effect where if uh, you know a human is smiling, that is contagious and other people will also smile or whatever. Um, in your studies on AI and robots and you know their interaction with human, uh, have you seen any relationship like a love-hate relationship with robots or AI? Yes, uh, there are some research published on the acceptance of robots employed in different type of services, uh, businesses. For example, in the case of hotels, uh, the most part of the employees uh, understand the use of robots in the case of being a complement to the service uh, given to the customer. So uh, in some cases, as for example, in the case of uh, some hotels that are working entirely with robots, there are some uh, big problems with failures uh, and other types uh, of um, technology uh, application uh, that can be improved in the case of being controlled by humans in the case of having uh, the necessity of doing that. So in some restaurants and other types of uh, service businesses, uh, the robots are also uh, supervised by a human that can control everything and check that everything is working uh, perfectly. So uh, there is like a, a, it is a love relationship, but because the robots can attract also customers, but there is also um, a, possibility of having some problems of acceptance between the, the crew or the employees because using robots can be perceived as uh, eliminating or destroying uh, uh, employment. All right. Thank you very much, Alitia. Uh, Balaji, my next question is to you. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the noise. There's like those gardeners that are cutting the trees. So. Um, this is a common question again because many people are really confused about what is actually robot and what is ai and what is all this stuff and it's pretty interesting uh, this question came uh, may i ask what's the difference between ai and robots sometimes it's hard for me to define robots for example is alexa a robot <clears throat> and, and i think dr rust was alluding to it right because a lot of yes. intelligence we see could be physical it could be virtual Right, so software can be robots as well, and uh, you don't need the physical form of the robot for it to be a robot, right? So, uh, you know, uh, going back to sort of connecting it to a previous example that Alithia was talking about, you know, I've always told my students that one of the best applications of AI with feeling and love is going to come for children. You know, there's going to be like a new generation of toys that grew up with children that will learn to be the children's friend from birth. It will sing to it, detect emotion, you know, make the child laugh when the child is sad, uh, and maybe also have the ability to physically grow. And so when a child is born not knowing that something is not real, uh, the child can start building that kind of attachment to this so-called toy that, that is much better than a bra brother, right, who's mean to you or a, <laughs> or a sister, you know, as the case may be. Uh, but when you think about these types of cases, now the, the physical aspect of that becomes important, you know, for a child to have something to hug, right? And so the, the robotics aspect there becomes useful as a characteristic because other, you can have the same thing behaving with a child as an app on a phone, but it will be far less interesting for a child, maybe, right? And so clicking the app and constantly talking to it as the child grows. Uh, so, but this, this sort of answers the question your person is asking. You know, I don't think it, you don't need a physical instantiation of something for it to be AI. It could be purely in software. Uh, but then there are some cases where the physical instantiation is necessary. Like, you know, if you need food delivered to your room, somebody has to bring it to you, right? So, so I think that, that's, that's where the robotics, the physical aspect of robotics becomes important. Uh, an extension of this question, Balaji, for you is, uh, do you think a lot of this Care and fear of robots is because of the physical, uh, you know, representation of the robot itself. Because we watch movies like Transformers and Terminator and stuff like this, and then people are scared, like there's like robots taking over the planet and all this stuff. 
do you think if uh, we move more towards like you know um, artificially and intelligent devices or these uh, chatbots or stuff like this that would reduce the fear of robots or that's not a factor i think you raise an interesting question because i think the the physical aspect of robots can be used for good and bad right so we can see robots you know running into a fire to save people and coming out uh, but uh, you could also see you know robots being engineered to be terrorists who are employed to go to a home and start killing people right and if they are that smart and that good how do you attack that robot right so uh, i i i think we have to defend that we have to build the former while defending against the latter right so we shouldn't be surprised when that happens one day right so in 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 sort of defense and military applications we have to expect that these types of things could 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 be done like somebody who's really nefarious could engineer robots to do these bad things and we better have defense systems in place before we realize that uh, that it can happen because we know it's possible thank you very much uh, there's a specific question to professor rust and uh, it seems like somebody read your book uh, and uh, this person is saying that uh, you forecast the feeling economy coming for 2036 with the pandemic do you still uh, see that the date will remain the same Well, I think we have to realize there's probably a confidence interval around that. So I'm not going to uh you know, if 2036 comes and we say, "Sorry, we're only 95% of the way to the feeling economy." I'm not necessarily going to say that we were wrong. Um no, I I think that the pandemic only speeds things up. Absolutely. Um because everybody is becoming more online and online is where a lot of this stuff is happening as I said. All right, thank you. Uh, uh my other next question is for Professor Crispin and this is an interesting one. Uh what are your suggestions for educators who need to prepare their students for artificially intelligent future? Uh, it is an interesting one. I think it's uh in terms of the skill set that you need to succeed actually in terms of that future that there there's sort of two strategies there's 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 obviously an awareness of ai and and the technical skills that you may need to be able to to flourish in that uh area in terms of the forefront and the advances in in that respect so those sort of programming skills awareness of of, of big data opportunities and analytics and so forth um but i think actually i i would also echo the arguments around the need for uh students to have an emotional and critical intelligence um and those softer skills because those are most likely to be the skills that are the last things to go in terms of job prospects and opportunities out there it's going to be the hardest thing for ai to to replicate and also from a societal point to view that i think there's going to be a lot of thought around uh, to what extent do we want to keep humans in the loop to what extent do we need to keep humans critiquing what ai is coming up with and making those ethical decisions and making sure things are sound in that respect so i think the skill here is very much preparing students so that they can adapt and continue to continue adapting because you know things are not going to be stable that lifelong learning is going to be needed but focusing very much on either their emotional and and uh, emotional intelligence uh, and those softer skills but also potentially sort of, sort of technical aspects as well Thank you very much. So we are towards the end of the panel. I have one question that is for all of you um and that is because it's an academic conference. So uh I'm sure that a lot of students are um here to uh, listen to your answer to this question and that is if each of you can give us like two to three research ideas that you think are really important to uncover, right? For academic researchers, what would that be? So I can start with um uh, Ulithia if you can um tell me two to three topics that you think are very important to uncover okay so from my point of view it remains essential to explore how customers react to artificial intelligence and service robots uh, to ensure the successful application of this technology and it allows to start a co-creation process that can improve the functionalities of this technology and it is It's also uh, important to improve their robot human interaction experience and their robots relational capabilities. All right. Thank you very much Alithia. Um Banerjee, um, what is your take on it? No, I I think I'm just finishing a special issue in one of our journals on augmented intelligence. And uh, the theme there is how humans and AI can work together. And uh, that's a very promising and fruitful area because uh, 
you know, it, 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 it can be, the questions can be asked in uh, each domain in a very interesting way. So I, I would throw that one out as, a, as, an, as an important idea. And another thing that I would say is, you know, it's just studying the properties of AI, being more of a scientist than a person who falls for the hype would be really good. Because I think our job as researchers is to be able to peel the onion and tell the stories the way it is and expose mm -hmm. both the strengths and weaknesses and to study the properties uh, as well. And so having that objective lens and fairness and uh, transparency are areas where that issue is uh, coming coming up as well. So I, I would say these two are definitely promising areas. If anyone can work on building, building better algorithms, you know, all power to you, uh, <laughs> because there's huge potential there too. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Balaji. Uh, Professor Russ? Well, uh, Balaji took one of my uh, points <laughs> right there. Uh, I think that was totally correct. But, um, but I think that uh, one thing that we definitely need better is uh, for, for people who are technical, we need better algorithms for feeling intelligence. Though that really is not well set up. And my suspicion is that the traditional machine learning neural network approach isn't probably going to work for that. We probably need a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Rust. And then last but not least, Professor Kristen. Thank you. I think actually the first thing I would say is actually to address any of our research topics. I think sort of multidisciplinary research is essential. I think that's something the more we talk between disciplines, uh, that makes a big difference. But I would sort of say I'm interested in, and I think it'd be really interesting for organizations to understand how we can combine human decision making and AI decision making and what happens when the two are in conflict. How does that get resolved uh, and how do, you, how do you do that? I think understanding, mean, ensuring we can maintain a human critique of AI, especially when AI can be a black box, um, and how can that be achieved? So explainable AI, researching that, and also making sure it, it is making those uh, socially acceptable decisions. And I think the third one I would say is around work and how, if we are using AI so much more in the workplace, how can we ensure that AI is, continues to make meaningful work for humans um, and doesn't just downgrade employees to sort of being essentially human forms of robots. Uh, and we're starting to see that occurring in, in some some organizations and it, it's sort of you become incredibly mechanical. So, you know, how can we ensure meaningful work is still there for the things we want to do? Thank you very much. I um, All the ideas were superb. I actually was thinking about what you said in the end about the conflict res resolution between humans and AI, if, if that's the situation. I've been thinking about something called robot rights, uh, but anybody I talked to actually put it down. <laughs> I was thinking if you're working in, our, in an organization with an artificially intelligent robot and somehow you are harmed, who do you sue then? Uh, the robot, the organization or what, right? Or if you break the robot, uh, then robot in itself is a separate entity, whether you... <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of gray area in there. And I think all these ideas that um, came out of uh, all four uh, esteemed panelists are really interested. It's interesting to look into. Thank you once again um, to uh, our panelists and all, all the participants who uh, were here with us with, uh, for the wonderful questions that you have asked. Thank you. Uh, stay safe uh, and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.